All right. Excellent. Well, um, hello. My name is Austin Smokowitz. I'm one half of the design team uh, from Dr. Witz. Um, and this is Robotech Reconstruction being published through Strange Machine Games. Uh, the game is currently up for pre pre-orders right now at the strange machine games uh website you can go there it is 35 dollars before uh shipping um so if you if at any point along the way you find yourself interested go there take a look check it out but um let me jump into this game and what it is this is robotech reconstruction we are in the far future of 2013 it is two yeah, we are two years after the end of the first Robotech war wherein uh, the aliens and Trotty came to earth and tried to eliminate all of humanity they only got 90 percent of us so it's a win we consider that to be a win and here we are two years later with the survivors of that war uh, coming out and uh, and trying to and it, They've survived the war. It's two years later, and factions have formed as to which direction they want to take the Earth. And in this game, you get to play as one of those factions and shape what the future of Earth is going to look like. So I'm just going to go over these four factions. First uh, first up, we have the Robotech Defense Force, the RDF. They are, uh, you know, they are the heroes of the show. But um, they are also the ones for these last two years that have been holding the planet together because they've helped rebalance the ecosystem, the atmosphere. They've been helping, you know, they've been helping keep the, the population alive and stable. But now here we are two years later and they're concerned. They're concerned because when we fought the aliens and Trotty, not all of the aliens died. In fact, a lot of them crash landed on Earth after the last battle and actually became civilians. But they're not really used to civilian life. They've always lived a military culture. So uh, the RDF is really concerned with keeping these Zentradi civilians content as civilians in society. So they win the game if they're able to keep at least five Zentradi civilians content across this board because the last thing they want is a Zentradi uprising. Which brings us to our next faction, the Zentradi Rebellion. This faction is led by Commander Chiron, who has been hiding out for... who is uh, led by Commander Chiron, a high-ranking uh, Zentradi warrior, who has been hiding out on Earth for the last two years after the war. And he's heard from his spies that uh, the Zentradi civilian population has started to grow discontent with a civilian way of life. And he feels that now is the time to rise up and create the rebellion and finish the job that was started two years ago and enslave humanity and finish off the Micronians. Um, mean, and so the Zentradi rebellion wins the game if they are able to re to acquire, to recruit 11 of these Zentradi civilians from the board and get them into their army. And unlike every other faction at the table who has to, uh, who sees if they win or not based on an end of round check, if the Zentradi Rebellion at any point during the game gains those 11 civilians, they will win the game. Now we have, uh, we bring, which brings us to our third faction, the AUL, the Anti-Unification League. These are a mixture of human and Zentradi civilians that have been growing in a civil society, who has been growing in civil society and have been building up cities, urban centers around North America since the end of the war. And they have grown discontent with the fact that the RDF has essentially been a military, has been military leadership uh, for these last two years, you know, now granted for good reasons, they've had the tech since most of the stuff on earth was destroyed. The Robotech defense force and the SDF one is the, has been basically keeping everything together and making sure that, you know, humanity survives. But now they feel that they feel that, uh, the time is right to actually assert civilian control over these regions and take back 
uh, you know, take back their areas from the from the civilian life from the military. So the Anti Unification League wins if they are able to consolidate five cities under their control at the end of a round. And then that brings us to the fourth faction, the Robotech Expeditionary Force, the REF. Now, not every Zentradi ended up fighting against the humans. In fact, the REF is a faction of, Zen of the Zentradi aliens that defected during the last battle and helped the humans win and survive. This faction is led by Commander Britai, and he is flying around in a, a flagship above and around the Earth. And what these, what the REF knows is that beyond Earth, there are still threats out there. They know that there are others in Trotty that might come out to get them they know that there's uh you know there's other threats that may come to earth so what the ref wants to do is to consolidate earth underneath the robotech defense force because of course you're going to need a strong military in order to survive the coming threats to earth so they want to at the end of a round have at least seven territories on this board underneath rdf control that's what they need to do to win the game so with that bit of story and an idea of what these who these factions are, this is when I ask um, the players to be able to jump in and choose a faction that they would like to play, because one of the because this is an asymmetrical game, I essentially have to you know, teach each faction. So I'm essentially teaching the game four times. So it's nice for you to be able to look at your faction and only really pay attention when I'm talking about your people. <laughs> that you care about. Um, the only thing I will note is that because we are play going to be playing a three-player game, um, uh, the the REF is going to be controlled by a bot. So um, I'll ask you to uh, choose one of the three other factions at this time. Do you have a preference, Derek? Uh, I was just going to ask you if you had a preference. I don't know. I think the power of idle girls taking over is fun so we're gonna do this one <laughs> okay um very good i'll do the rebellion that seems seems my speed all right uh, i will jump in that's right okay so let's talk about some of the some of the key concepts of the game let's take a look at this board um and one of the things that uh, is very important to every faction is the idea of control. So let's talk about that. On this board, there are 13 spaces. We have 10 territories and 3 zones. Of the territories, we have 5 land territories, which are the Wastelands, the Northwest Quadrant, the Forest Preserve, Excalibur Command Center, the, and the Reclamation Sector. And we also have five cities. We have New Portland City, New Macross City, Monument City, New Detroit City, and Granite City. And as you can, as you already know, the AUL cares a little bit more about those city territories than the land mm -hmm. territories. Um, but of course, the city territories are marked by having oval, uh, round-ish border, having round borders. Land territories are are straight, and then the zones um, are hexagonal: the proto the protoculture zone, the fabrication zone, and the industrial zone. And the thing about them is that they don't get controlled like territories, but their main purpose is to actually house these protoculture tokens. And the tokens themselves are actually more important than the zone. But we'll talk about what that means when we get a little bit later in the rules. The main thing, though, is that when we look at the territories, you could see that each territory is controlled and each territory will have a control marker within it that can either be given to the RDF or the AUL. These tokens are flippable. But the interesting thing to note about these territories is that when you sit, when you count up to see who controls the territories, you actually add together the forces of the Zentradi Rebellion and the AUL, and you put them together to get control for the AUL, and you add up the number of forces be between the RDF and the REF to see if it is uh, controlled by the RDF. So if we come over here to New Portland City, 
you'll see that we have two RDF military mecha, two AUL partisans, and one Zentradi covert soldier. And so because we have three to two in the territory, the territory belongs to the RDF. Um, it's But if we come over here to Monument City, you'll see that we have two RDF military mecha and two AUL partisans, which means that you have a tie in the territory and the territory itself is uncontrolled. Um, each faction also has a hero standee, like this is the RDF, this is the RAF flagship, and the hero standee also, each of the hero standees only count as one towards control as well. Um, so here in the Northwest Quadrant, yeah, they, the RAF has, a has their flagship, and so it's RDF controls it. Meanwhile, the uh, AUL also has these city tokens that once they get put on the board also count as one towards control for the AUL. Um, city token, once a city token is put down, it cannot be removed. So that's a little fun thing. The second thing that these territories also have are contentment tracks. So each contentment track also houses some Zentradi civilians. Each Zentradi civilian is a token that has the ability to move up and down these tracks. And what's interesting is that if a Zentradi token ever gets all the way over on the left-hand side of one of these tracks in like the green area, that means that that civilian is content. And that counts as one point of right one point towards progress victory uh, for the RDF. Meanwhile, however, when the uh, Zentradi civilian moves from the yellow to the red and then moves on to the Zentradi shield, instead of moving on to the shield, the civilian is actually removed from the board and a covert Zentradi warrior gets placed into the Zentradi rebellion hideout. The Zentradi rebellion has a hideout on their board. So this is how civilians are acquired by the Zentradi Rebellion. And, as, and if at any time they have collected 11 of them, they will have won the game. It's also it's interesting to note that for as far as the civilians are concerned, there are more civilians in the cities than in the land territories. And there are far more civilians up here in the heavily populated centers of New Macro City and Monument City than down here in the southern areas of like Granite City and New Detroit City. So as you're the Zentradi Rebellion looking around, you know, that's in, that's an important distinction uh, to note. Mm hmm. So, uh, with those key concepts out of the way, let's talk about how you take a turn. Uh, in this game, the heart of the game is this uh, reconstruction event deck. So we have an event deck, and in this event deck, uh, there are many cards that have action, that have uh, the, the events associated with them. And at the beginning of the game, each player is going to uh, have four cards in their hand. And at the beginning, and uh, the way that your turn is structured is the first thing you're able to do on your turn is you're able to trade one of those cards with another player. Uh, and of course, in this game, table talk, making plans, making deals is highly encouraged. Um, and incentive and and will and is incentivized as you'll see in a moment. But uh, the thing is that uh, when you're making deals and making plans, the only thing you're able to to trade are the event cards. And even if you all trade event cards, you don't have to play the card you just traded for. Um, and you, what you are not able to trade is uh, like protoculture which we have a protoculture track here. And a thing to understand is that protoculture in this world is the stuff you use to get things done. Um, everybody needs it. Everybody has a certain amount of it. And as you take actions on your turn, you're going to be spending this protoculture. I will probably just eventually call this income at some point along the way. But but it's your it's your income. It's, it's your protoculture. And... Um, and so you're not able to trade protoculture, but you are able to trade one card on your turn and you're able to make plans and deals. But the plans and deals you make are not binding. And when I say that, that might sound like, 
oh no, this is a game of treachery and backstabbery. But really, no. Usually when you make when people make deals with each other, they're mutually beneficial and they are working towards a common goal of, say, you two working together to stop me from winning the game. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and um, what this and the reason why the game or the reason why deals are not binding is because this is a fairly tactical game and you might find that by the time you say make a card trade you say hey i'll play this now and you play this later and that person says sure but then when it gets around to their turn you might say okay wait don't play that card i gave you that probably doesn't work right now and because because you made that deal the game doesn't bind you to making what would now be a very bad decision um, so the first thing you do in your turn is you have the ability to trade a card. And then you're going to play a card from your hand. And we have a row down here. Uh, we have a row here that keeps track of players' turns as the game goes on. And when it is your turn, as indicated by your faction marker, will be above one of the, one of the four card slots. You will take a card from your hand and you will play it uh, beneath, your, uh, beneath your token. So you're gonna. So you have the option to trade a card. You will then play a card, and then you are going to take actions off of your player mat. You're going to take one or two actions depending on what card you played, and we call that taking command. Um, once you have finished taking command, uh, you then will draw a card indicating that that's the end of your turn. So, let's talk about the cards. When you play a card. Each card has uh, four parts to it. It has, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, it has a symbol indicating which faction that card represents. Each card is, belongs to a, a specific faction. Um, on the right-hand side, we have, a, we have the reaction column. Once a card is played, we first look at the reaction column to see who goes next in the round. The, top, the highest one... The highest faction that has not yet gone gets to go next. So I'm the RDF. I play a card. RDF is first next. So it's like, no, not no, because I already went. So the next faction that's going to go is the REF. So now we know that the REF is going to take their turn next in the round. After that, we have a white box and a black box. The white box is the event of the event card. And when you play an event card, that white box... Uh, will be played to the best of its ability, no matter what, and any decisions gets to be decided by the faction who controls the card. So this is an I'm the RDF and I play an AUL card, and this says place four partisans from out of play into any one city. The AUL, because it's an AUL card, gets to decide where those partisans are going to go, what city they're going to jump, which city they're going to get placed into. Uh, so the and and that's the same for all of these event cards. The event card holder gets to choose the gets to decide what happens with the event. And then there is the black box action. And uh, the black box action either is an optional action that the faction card holder will get to ta- has the option of taking. And um, and again, this black box depend is done or not depending on uh if depending on who played the card so if i play if i'm the R, i'm the rdf and i play an aul card the aul will do the white box action and then have the option of taking of executing one move action if i played my own card instead the white box i would play out the white box action but then i am going to ignore the black box action because i played my own event card and this really gets into this, the next part of the turn, taking command. When you take command, you are going to take one or two actions depending on what card you played. If you played your own faction event card, when you take command, because when you take command, you will take one normal action from your board. If, however, you played another faction's event card, you will t- you have the ability to take two actions off of your board and you have unlocked your special actions so in this way the game highly encourages you to play other factions event cards on your turn because you get to do more on you get to do more when you take command and you get to do more powerful things that will help you towards your victory as you do so 
Um, <clears throat> right. So well, then we get to taking command. And this is when we're going to jump into uh, all of the different types of actions that we can do. Uh, I'll, before I jump into that, does anybody have any questions at this point? Should I just press on? Uh, that sounds good to me. I, I like yeah. this. It's like a, it's got the the coin vibes, but much mm -hmm. less complicated out the box. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. The idea here is to to make it to to get that uh, get that feel, but still put put it, ground it in the Robotech universe, but also put the, get the bar. Try to bring bring the bar, uh, you know, down as much as possible while still making it a, a meaty uh, games, a meaty game where you still have to decide a whole bunch and and still play in about two hours. Mm -hmm. um, so okay, so I'm going to get into the actions here, and at the top level, um, at the top level of of action taking, you every faction has normal actions, every ha faction has special actions that is much more explicit in helping them achieve their goals and um and at this high level the the human factions the AUL and the RDF tend to do things the same way oh no did we lose you and the Zen uh, so when you when the Zentradi factions move, they move on a one to one basis. So when the uh, REF moves, they're going. Ooh, we... <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, when we talk about moving on the board, uh, when we talk about adjacent territories, this should be fairly simple but again you know if you're looking at the ref flagship here in the northwest quadrant and you move to an adjacent territory the northwest quadrant has a lot of different places they can move to the industrial zone new macross city excalibur forest preserve granite city the fabrication zone the wastelands new portland there's a lot of places that they could go um but the um the ref also has another bit where they have some space on their board which is which represents battle pods that are hanging out within the hull of their hull of their ship. So they have they have two parts of their board, which represents you know machines that are uh, battle pods that are broken down, but available to be used. And they also have a constructed side, which represents uh, battle pods that can be taken from taken from here and dropped onto the same territory as their as the flagship. So as the flagship is moving around, they're also moving around the units that are within its hold. Um, now, when we look at these actions, so let's take a look at these at Charlie Rebellion Action Board. When I say you have actions and you have the ability to take two actions, what that means is you will be able to take two different actions from your board. And the way that this works is that you will select one action so let's say you have the ability to select two actions. So you will select one of these actions. Doesn't matter that one's on top, one's on the bottom. You could pick any one, any which one you want first. But when you select an action, some of them have this little circular, have this little circular icon next to it, which means that the action itself is repeatable. So for example, when we say move, it's when the Zentradi Rebellion says they're going to move, that means they can move and then move again, and then move again. Because like I said, for the Zentradi, um, it costs one protoculture to move one unit, one space. So when you take, when you select the move action, you act, you will be have the ability to take it again and again and again and again and again. And units themselves do not exhaust as you move. And this is true for all factions. So, um, so as you're moving, you could take say these units down over here in the wastelands and just say okay well i'm going to move both of them all the way up here to monument city and that's going to cost me one two three four that cost me six protoculture to get these units across the board but one thing that the zentradi rebellion has is their hideout and the nifty thing about the hideout is that nobody except the zentradi rebellion knows where it is so a Zentradi Rebellion unit is able to move from the hideout to any space on the board. So 
In that example of trying to move the end, any space on the board is connected back to the hideout. So for these two uh, Zentradi units to move from the Wastelands to Monument City, instead of spending six to move across the board, they could move two to get to the hideout and two more to Monument City. They could just spend four to shortcut themselves across the board like that. Um, yep. So that's, that's how the Zentradi move. The way that the humans move, though, are different. The humans move on a territory-by-territory basis. So when the AUL decides to move, they're going to select a territory, like say New Detroit City, and then they have the option of moving every unit in that, in that territory to adjacent territories or not. So New Detroit City, they could say, okay, well, I want to move one into Forest Preserve, but then keep the other one there. And now what this does is, well, now that it's one to one in the city, the city itself is going to become uncontrolled but he's going to have moved one into the Forest Preserve, so now the Forest Preserve is controlled by the AUL. But like we said, the move action is repeatable. So now he could just say, well, uh, that was my first move, and now I'm going to move again, and I'm going to move the Forest Preserve, and ah, now the Forest Preserve is going to come over here to the Northwest Quadrant, which means the Forest Preserve becomes uncontrolled, and the Northwest Quadrant becomes uncontrolled. So one thing to see here is that, again, units do not exhaust, and um, control of territories is completely fluid as we move through it. Uh, it's more like these markers are really just here for our reference, more so than anything else, um, as, as a turn goes on. So that we can remember, like, oh yeah, the, the reclamation sector is controlled by the AUL. Um, you know, the same thing is true, you know, so when we talk about movement for the RDF, it's the same thing when they say, okay, I'm going to move, uh, right, Excalibur Command Center, we're going to have uh, one, we're going to have this guy move up to Monument City, and we're going to have these two move off, well, we're going to have one move into the Forest Preserve, and the other one move off into the Northwest Quadrant, right, you're able to split things up, you're able to keep it, keep it together, and then, eh, I'm going to move again, Northwest Quadrant, move this over to New Portland City, and, and uh, at least make it uncontrolled. Um, so that's the move action. Uh, the second action we want to talk about is the recruit action. Um, when the AUL recruits, they just need to, they will spend one protoculture to take one of their units that's out of play and put it into a territory that they control. And this is a good time to note that any units, any pieces that are on the wood table, they are considered to be out of play, which means that uh, you know no that nobody nobody has control over those factions. There's going to be card effects that say bring into play or take out of play, and that's what it means. You're going to be putting it back on the table, and it also it also means this also means that each faction has a hard cap on units. So once the AUL has eh, moved all of their has recruited all of their uh, units onto the board, even if another card effect comes on and says, hey, bring four more units into from out of play, they have no units out of play to do so. So one thing to uh, keep in mind. Yeah, we can move those back. And um, so, uh, that is, so that's how the AUL recruits. The way that the RDF recruits is that they are going to be converting AUL partisans into military mecca so we'll be exchanging we'll be training those partisans into mecca and the rdf also has the ability to turn two mecca into a veritech fighter which in this game for the rdf the veritech fighters are extremely important because they need them into inf to do their influence action and actually keep those civilians content so eventually the rdf will want to get uh, more uh, Veritex onto the board so that they can actually, you know, achieve their goals. Uh, meanwhile, when the REF recruits, they are taking these busted battle pods that are just sitting around and they are constructing them and moving them over to the constructed side so that they are now available to be brought down onto the board. But on the flip side, for the Zentradi Rebellion, when the Zentradi Rebellion recruits, they're going to be taking in a territory that they control. Their part, their soldiers are going to be convincing battle pods to join their side. And these Zentradi soldiers are going to come in as overt warriors. Now, this is a good point to, 
to point out that the Zentradi has uh, covert sides and overt sides. And this becomes uh, really important when we talk about attacks, because whereas the Zentradi Rebellion is able to attack any faction, other factions are only able to attack overt units of theirs. So let's talk about attacking. When we, have, uh, when we talk about attacking, uh, each of these units have a different attack value or like the, an attack force or the amount of units that they're able to destroy when they're activated for an attack. For the Zentradi Rebellion, Chiron is able to destroy two units by himself. Each of the covert and overt mecha are only able to destroy one unit. Um, e when, when the Zentradi Rebellion takes the attack action, they're only able to attack once with each unit. And for every covert unit that attacks, they get flipped over to their overt side. Um, and it's also important to note that Commander Chiron also has his own P token indicating uh, covert indicating or uh, overtness. So when Commander so Commander Chiron does not become overt when he attacks. Instead, Commander Chiron is overt if he's ever in a territory with only overt units or in a territory without any other um, without any other Zentradi Rebellion units. If he's balled by, him, by his lonesome, he is overt and vulnerable to attack. If he is in a territory with at least one covert unit, Chiron also remains covert. Uh, so that is one thing to keep in mind, because for the Zentradi Rebellion, Chiron is a pretty important piece that you need in order to get your stuff done, because he is the figurehead that uh, that brings those civilians over to your side. So when you go out and at attacking, you still want to keep him safe, even though he is a powerful unit. Um, when we talk about attacking for all of the other factions, the AUL... Uh, they attack at a two to one ratio. Um, so for so when they attack, they, for every two units of every two partisans of theirs, they are able to destroy one unit. Um, if they had, uh, let's say, here we go. Let's say they had, uh, and also because again, the Zentradi attack on a one to one basis, where uh, the AUL and the RDF attack on a territory by territory basis. Let's say, for instance, there were. Oop. Let's say, for instance, we had a situation where we had uh, this happening in New, De New Detroit City. So, with the four units, the AUL has the potential to destroy two units, but they're only able to attack one faction at a time. So, with these three here, they would still say, "I'm going to attack with New Detroit City, and I'm going to choose. Eh, we're going to we're going to pick the RDF to destroy." And the thing about all attacks is that when you're the attacker, you never lose any units in your attack. And um, and this is another universal thing that when you are the defender and you defend and you are getting attacked, you get to you get to choose which pieces get removed. So if we had this scenario and the RDF and the AUL attacked the RDF, okay, so I have so the they have attack power of two, so the RDF will have to destroy two of these units. They get to choose which two to destroy, and this is and and this is kind of important in the sense that um, hero standees, the ones on standees, they basically have plot armor. So you can they can be destroyed in battle, but they will return next turn. <laughs> they will return in the next round. You cannot. They do not die permanently. They can just be removed from the board for a time. So sometimes it might be better to get them off the board than some more of your pieces that are a little bit more costly to bring on. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so the AUL has those two attacks. When we talk about attacking for the RDF, uh, Rick Hunter is able to attack for two, Military Mecha attack for one, and Veritech Fighters also attack for two. Um, and over here for the REF, they their battle pods do not attack. However, their flagship does. Their flagship is able to destroy all Z overt Zentradi warriors in a space in one go. Oh, man. In, 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the attack action. Um, the Zentradi Rebellion also has... Uh, the Zentradi Rebellion, RDF, and REF have a flip action, and their flip action is specifically to flip over uh, Zentradi units for the Zentradi Rebellion. It's flipping from overt to covert. For the RDF and REF, it's about finding them and flipping them back to their overt side. The AUL does not have a flip action because they are not able to see the Zentradi threat within their mist. Um, the, uh, then we want to talk about the influence action. So again, the influence action is the main way in which the Zentradi Rebellion and the RDF win. Uh, get around their get around to their victory condition. So, uh, for the Zentradi Rebellion, they need to be in a territory that the AUL control, and they need to have Chiron in that territory. And with those, they are then able to uh, influence or move Zentradi civilians one step to the right down these tracks. And again, with the Zentradi Rebellion, uh, when they move a civilian to the right and onto the Zentradi shield, the civilian comes off the track. That's a point. The Zentradi Rebellion gains a point, and a- another recruit is brought into their hideout. They're actively converting the civilian population into their warriors. Um, and like I said, and because the action is repeatable, when they take it, like, if they were here at Granite City, they could just get both of these off and get two points for doing so. Um, meanwhile, for the uh, for the R- for the RDF, their recruitment is a little bit more uh, cumbersome. They need to have a they need to have either a either Rick Hunter and a Ver- and a military mecha in a territory to influence, or they need a Veritech fighter and a military mecha in order to influence, or they could replace the military mecha with battle pods in order to do the influence action. There's four different combinations, but in order for them to do the influence action, they need to have some combination thereof. So if Rick Hunter and the Veritech fighter are there, it doesn't matter if there's just some battle pods and military mecha hanging around in a territory, they can't influence. So those, so um, whereas the Zatrari Rebellion cares about one thing in particular, one unit in particular, the um, the RDF cares about having these com- these combined arms moving around the map in order to actually get what they want done. Um, for the REF, it's rather simple. They need to control the REF. The RDF needs to control the territory, and there needs to be a battle pod in the region, and then they can they have the ability to move the civilian either way. Uh, one protoculture per movement. Um, and the AUL has a very interesting uh, influence action. Their influence action is actually holding a concert. So whatever territory Lin, uh, Lin Min Mei is in, she holds a concert. And for every uh, partisan in that territory, you can either choose to gain one protoculture or move one civilian up or down one space on the contentment track. So if you had Lynn here and she says, oh, I'm going to do a concert, I see that you know, Chiron is going to probably take them. So oh, I could do uh, one, two, three to go one, two, three and make that more expensive for Chiron. And then with the last two, I'm gonna gain two protoculture off of it. Or you could say, you know what? Forget Chiron, doesn't matter, one, two, three. I'm just going to take five protoculture. I'm going to, I'm going to call that my influence action. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that the AUL has that nobody else has is the build action. This is not repeatable. It's only They can only do it once per turn. But what they, what they do is in a territory that they control, they pay two protoculture, and then they remove two partisans from the board and they put down one AUL city token. Now this is important for a number of reasons. Every time that they control a territory with a city token, that counts as one point towards their victory. The other thing is that these city tokens can be can be built anywhere on the board and there can be multiple within the same space. So if we had this, Granite City is now worth three victory points for the AUL alone just by controlling it. And again, they only need five to win. Um, 
the cities, as mentioned before, also count towards their influence of controlling the territory, and cities cannot be destroyed through attacks. Uh, they become permanent fixtures of the landscape. Um, but of course, if uh, if enough force comes in to actually to take the territory back, and that's not even enough to do it in this case. But if the ter but if it takes gets taken back, then the uh, then the AUL will lose those three points as they are now controlled by the other faction. But for the other faction, for the uh, REF, REF cares about territories only. So whereas Granite City is worth three points for the AUL, it is still only worth one point for the REF. Um, finally, every faction has a has an income action which is a way of gaining some extra protoculture. What you do when you take the income action is you look at the board and you say, oh, how many, uh, how many territories are underneath my con combined faction control? You count those up and you gain the amount of protoculture uh, to the equivalent of, of that much, uh, with the understanding that the uh, RDF will gain two protoculture per territory while everybody else only gains one. But as you probably noticed, the RDF also, all of their actions are far more expensive, are like three times the cost of any of yours. So they gain a lot of protoculture, but they're also going to be spending it like crazy. Um, so eventually, players will continue to play cards. The, uh, uh, the row will fill up. And eventually you'll have a, a situation that looks like this. Everybody will have gone. Everybody will have taken a turn. And then we get to the end of end of round. Now, there's a lot of steps here, but each one is fairly simple. And, um, and it's really more like every faction gets to take an additional action. So as you're taking your turn, it's also nice to know that, oh, maybe, you know, you want to do something, but then remember, oh, right, I get to do that at the end of the round. So maybe I can hold off until then to do it. So the first thing we do in the resolution bar is we is we do a victory check. We skip this in the first turn, but from the second turn and on, it is possible for the game to end with somebody winning. When we do a victory check, we pop over here to our uh, victory conditions board and we see if anybody's won. And let's say, for example, uh, the R the AUL and the RDF have both bested their uh, bested their point total, right? So who wins? Well. What we do is we look back at the the order of the of the turn. We look back at the turn order and we see that well the RDF went earlier in the round. So presumably they had met their victory condition earlier, which means that there was more time for everybody else to stop them from winning, and they didn't. So the RDF wins the game. But again, we skip that in the first round, and we move right on to the income and uh, return protoculture. So everybody gets to take their income action. They get they get their income action. And then this is where we talk about the protoculture tokens. So again, um, these protoculture tokens are most likely going to be in their zones. There are a couple of card actions that will move the tokens around, but for 90% of the game, they're going to be sitting in these zones. So when we look at the protoculture zone, the uh, shared alliance system falls apart, and now we just look at factional control. So if we had a situation like this, where we had two Zentradi warriors and one AUL partisan, the token will go to the Zentradi rebellion, and they will gain three additional protoculture. If you had only one Zentradi rebellion and one AUL partisan, then the protoculture will go to the RDF. It is, and if the territory is empty, the protoculture will go go to the RDF. It is presumed that they that the RDF has control over these regions until it is explicitly taken away by another faction. Um, so, uh, if the protoculture token had been moved, say here to New Detroit City, where one 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 the protoculture will go to the RDF. If a protoculture has been moved out of it, uh, they will they will at this point in time move back to the zones. Um, <clears throat> after we all gain some extra income, then the Zentradi Rebellion and the RDF get to take an additional influence action. Again, this will cost protoculture, but it is repeatable. So uh, if Chiron was sitting out uh, here in Granite City and they still had control, and they didn't do it on their turn, yeah, they could influence all of these uh, recruits off and take it. 
Um, once the recruits have finished, then we get to the retreat. Uh, it's back to the hideout. So at this point, Chiron and any overt mecha on the board are going to come back to the hideout and switch back to, to being covert. And once they have finished doing that, the RDF has to retreat to refuel. They have to refuel back at cities that they control. So if we looked at this board and we said, okay, so there's a whole lot of RDF, you know, so the RDF controls New Macross and Monument City, but they got a lot of units hanging out all over the place. At this point, they will, without costing any protocol, have to move back to cities that they control. They and the RDF always has the ability to move back to New Macross City, even if it's underneath somebody else's control. During this phase, they can always they always have New Macross City as a place of refuge for them. Uh, then the AUL and the REF get to take their recruit action. Again, repeatable cost protoculture, but they, you know, they can get some units from out of play onto the board, and the REF is able to, uh, you know, build more of these battle pots. After that happens, if any hero standee had been taken off the board due to an attack or through card play, they will respawn. Minmay will respawn in Granite City. Rick will come back to New Macross City, and the, the REF player gets to place the flagship wherever it wants because it is a ship up in space. Um, then the, the penultimate uh, item here on the resolution bar is we have these special event cards. And every round, one, uh, two special event cards are going to come from out of play into the player's hands of which they control. So every round, the Zentradi Rebellion will gain an extra card. At the end of the first round, the REF will get one, then the AUL, and then the RDF will get one as well. As the game goes on, these cards become more powerful, but they're just sitting out here in the open, so you are able to take a look at them at any time you want. Uh, finally, after the special event cards come out, we just reset and refresh. We clean up the card deck. We get everything, you know, we get everything ready for the next round. Uh, we look down here at the timeline to say, see who goes first, because each round there's a predetermined faction who goes first. The RDF goes first in the first round, and the REF goes first in the second round. So when we reset for the second round, ah, we just put the... REF there and we say okay that's it they're ready to go um and that's it that is all of the rules that's all the rules to the game uh do you guys have any questions at this point i i think that uh that explained things pretty well i think that once we get our hands in this we'll probably have some more questions but you know uh, of in terms of grand concept i get it so yeah, f obviously, feel free to ask any questions as we go through it. Um, and so here we go. I'm just going to reset the board. Let's throw you some cards. Let's get some cards in your hand. Uh, I'm going to shuffle that. So this event deck is separated into two halves. So uh, there are uh, slightly less explosive cards at the beginning, and then more explosive cards as you get to the end. So everyone starts off with four cards in their hand. Um, the bot, I'm just going to sit, so you guys can take a look at your cards. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to set up the bot now. And the thing about the bot is that um, the bot has its own player board, and it has 10 uh, special, and it has t um, 20 cards that will help determine how what it does and how it performs. So I'm just going to pull that pull that stuff out here and get it all set up. Uh, we have a so yeah, we're, we have this automated bot. They have a I'll just flip that over. On the back of its player board, it has some little instructions as to how to uh, set it up. Uh, but basically, uh, I'm just going to get this popped up here. So is this a three or four players only then? Yes, this is a three or four player game in the box. Mm -hmm. um, my co-designer and I, we are working on other factions to uh, 
be able to we're looking at we're working on other bots to be able to allow for lower player counts or uh, solo play but as far as what you get out of the box it is a three or four player experience gotcha which is really what what we um which is really we feel is the way to play this game um like we feel that there is a you know there's a high amount of interactivity and it it would really be a shame for people not to be able to uh, to think that that's not how it goes because like the bots are a little different you know they have to do things because they're dumb but <laughs> you know they're a little dumb but they also um you know they they also don't really they don't necessarily behave in the same way that humans do um yeah it's like you want the uh, discussion of diplomacy or dune or you know all those talking games right where you're conniving mm-hmm. and dealing with other players and it's impossible to do that with a bot that's right um yeah but, uh yeah so you know, so the bot here they have like obviously when when it gets to the bot's turn we'll go over exactly how that works but um but uh yeah so this is uh so we're ready here um you have your card decks uh so at the beginning of the first round the rdf goes first which means i get to start the game and i get to start with the dilemma of how to actually proceed uh doing this <laughs> um Hmm. I don't want to do that yet. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. that, would be that. So you okay. can swap cards if you wanted to at this point? Yeah, so the first thing I'm able to do is I'm able to uh, make a uh, card swap. And I would have to ask Smoothest Jazz. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I do have a card that would that is beneficial to you, but you would Buy want it. me to play it. But there's a there's you could take a look at that. Um, but the question is: Is there? Do you do you think you have anything you'd want to give me? Yes. Do I just drag it over? Do you? Uh, you can. Yeah. There you go. I see. So you'd want me to play that. I sure would. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. I can help you okay. win. Uh, okay, but... Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> What's up, Joe? I can help you win, right? We, we have this, a lot of the same... Uh, I mean... You know, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. I mean, we are diametrically opposed in our <laughs> goals. Um, so I'll say this, I, I am willing to, uh, play this card, but I'd like you to try to keep it kind of down in the Southern region. I can do that. Yeah. What you're choosing to do. I was, uh, that's already my master plan. Don't worry about it. Okay. All right. Then I would not have a problem playing this down. <laughs> so <laughs> this is Minmay missing. So first thing we do is we check the reaction column. We see that I've already gone, so we know that the bot is going to be going next. That's good. That'll be a good choose. So now the AUL gets to uh, do the other event. It does the white box action and the black box action the card. So first they get to place four AUL partisans from out of play into any one city. And like I said, I hope that he would play it somewhere down here in this southern ter- southern area of the board. Um, and then uh, Minmay gets removed uh, from play, but she will return in the resolution phase. Oh, wh- wh- so it's one city. So you're you're splitting them. Oh, all in one city. Okay. Yeah, they all got to go into one city. But now that you've done that, you also now from the black box action have the ability to execute one move action, which. All the black box actions are the same in this regard is that they always say execute one of something from your board. So now you could say, oh, you're going to do the move action. You could move. You could select new Detroit City and now have the ability to move all of those partisans you just put down into other places. Yes. But that's that is your call. Going to move one to here and I move I toggle this back to a five to four, right? Right. And because you're a human, you 
move on a territory by territory. So you moved mm-hmm. one unit, but you could potentially move all of your units in that space to adjacent spaces. Two. And so I could move them to different ones, and that would have still only cost the one? Yeah, it costs one to just activate the territory, and then every unit in that territory has the ability to move. Cool. So that is that is my play. Okay. So let's just say, yeah, you got them up to the Forest Preserve, which now puts the Forest Preserve underneath your mm-hmm. jurisdiction as well. Okay, so now that the event card has uh, triggered, uh, I will take my turn. And because I played another faction's event card, I get to take two actions uh, from my normal and special actions off of my board. So... I am going to let's do a little bit more conservative. So I'm going to select the move action. First move is going to be Excalibur Command Center. Move one up to Monument City, taking it. Taking Monument City for a... And then the we're going to move one out to the northwest quadrant. And that costs three. Uh, actually, we'll just move both out there. We'll we'll leave northwest. We'll leave Excalibur un, unopposed. And then I'll spend three more to move these two over to New Portland City, bringing it under RDF control for another three. And I'm going to play this a little conservatively this time. And let's say I'm going to take the income action. So I'm going to do one, two, three. That's four territories. So I'm going to gain eight protoculture off of that. So I'm going to jump up to 32. And I'm going to call that my turn. So I end my turn by drawing a card off of the top of the deck and putting it in my hand. Great. Uh, which now brings us to the uh, the bot's turn. So the bot also has a hand of cards. And the first thing they do is they are going to just randomly draw one of these cards off the deck and play it. So let's see what they have lost. OK, so they play We Are the Same, which first we look at the reaction column. And this sets up the turn order for the rest of the round making the AUL go second and next, and the Zentradi Rebellion will go last. So the action is replace any two uh, partisans with two uh, two uh, b- b- battle pods from out of play. So the way they do that is the bot has a, has a territory deck, which we're going to shuffle, and they're just oh. going to pull cards until they find a territory that, oh, look at that, New Detroit City. Oh, sure. no. <laughs> so they're going to take two... Uh, they're going to take two partisans out of New Detroit City, Oops. and uh, they're, that's going to make New Detroit City part of theirs. So well, there cool. goes the whole game. GG, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this 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 game is far from over. It has just begun. Um, <laughs> and as we go on, then that uh, that means that the RDF RDF now has six territories under its control. One, two, three, four, five. No, that's still just five. Right, it's not territories you want, it's uh, content civilians. Right, I want content civilians, but they want territories. So mm. uh, so now what they do is they're going to take their turn proper. So whenever the bot goes, they ignore the black box actions on their event cards. They only do the white box actions. And the first, and what they do is the first thing they do is they get to uh, three, four, five. They get to move five bots over, five battle pods into their constructed side. And then they're just going to draw one of these drop cards. <laughs> and then it's going to tell them to drop. Let me show you a different card. So most of the cards look like this. They have a number of territories and how many bots are going to get put into it. But i drawn the card that says all the bots are going to drop in the same spot. So we draw that, and they're all going to go to the northwest. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Bam. Okay, so um, the last thing that the bot does is on its turn, if there are any Zentradi sitting there, so let's say uh, 
let's say that they drew the north the wasteland card the first of all the flagship always goes to the place with the last territory that was drawn so as as i showed here before there's like three territories the flagship is going to go to the final territory um and if it went here all zentradi warriors get flipped over to overt and then depending on how many uh units are in the territory it will kill that many zentradi <laughs> warriors so uh this goes here the flagship goes here the Northwest Quadrant is now safely in RDF hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is going to uh, end their turn. And just like anything else, they are going to grab a, grab a card, shuffle it up, and and that's the end of their turn. So, uh, AUL, you, it is your turn. Right. Jack's time to shine. Let me see. <laughs> so, let me see what card. And New Portland City, that's the one over there on the left. That's right, that is... Hmm. That's that's over here. And because this is your first time doing it, obviously all of the cards are going to be new with all effects you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. But as you've probably seen, the deck itself is not that big. There's only 10 cards left. Which means that this is a this is a set of cards that we expect players to uh, become very familiar with fairly quickly. So after a while, you're going to know kind of like which cards to be on the lookout for, which cards you're going to want to ask for, which cards you have to be wary of. Um, and yeah, you're going to play the power of love. I am going to play the power of love. 